All right, guys, just real quick, I wanted to let you know this is one of the longest videos I've made, so there are timestamps in the description down below, especially if you can't take it all in at once, but it's really quality content that can change the way you approach the sport of trials. And if you are enjoying this, I would encourage you to write more. Just comment more down below, and I'll see if I can get Chris back on the channel. All right, let's get into this. All right, well, I'm super excited for today's interview. I am going to be talking with Chris Pizzelli, and I met him at the Trials Training Center, and his wife, Abigail, are, are fabulous riders, wonderful people, and I'm really excited because of the back background that he has into the sport. So Chris, do you mind uh, sharing your, your background and, uh, and, and what we're going to be talking about today? Sure, Tom. First, I just want to say I'm, I'm grateful for what you're doing for the sport. Everywhere I go, people are talking about trials progression. So I'm happy to be here. And, uh, and hopefully this helps a lot of folks continue on with their trials progression. Awesome. So um, my background, uh, where do we start? I'll start in the abbreviated form of it. Um, I went to graduate school I'm undergraduate and graduate, so I straddle the line between biology and psychology. So somewhere in the neuroscience area, I have um, a lot of cognitive experience, so learning, emotion, memory, all those kind of thing. And I also dabble in the neuroscience side of it, so neurons, brain regions, those kind of things. And I've had research that spans memory and aging, schizophrenia, and animal models of learning and memory. So um, kind of all over the board. And at present, I, I do largely research-based and I also teach some neuroscience courses for some major universities in the, in the country. That's awesome. Well, this this should be a lot of fun because undoubtedly, in order to get better at trials, you have to learn and there's things that are happening in your brain, not just your body. So I'm eager to hear uh, what you have to share with us today. Yeah, it's, you know, We'll try to keep this a conversational format, but I do kind of have to lay a couple of things out there because of a lot of what we'll discuss and hopefully we can get to it. There's just so much to it. So I, I don't want to say this now, but we may have to do this in installments because humans are complex, you know, so, um, but I'm just going to lay out the definition that I use for learning. And it is a relatively permanent change in an organism's behavior due to experience. So, and the reason why I say that is the, the, the key words there are relatively permanent. So when we start to get into how do we actually acknowledge that we've learned something. So if you do a task twice, it's not really learning yet. You've completed the task using certain circuitry, but until that circuitry gets set in stone, until you can repeat that a week later, two weeks later, we don't consider it learning. So we're going to keep revisiting that relatively permanent um, component of learning. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. About like I know you've had some videos on muscle memory and I think mm -hmm. it's a really handy thing for people to think about, but I kind of shift a little bit from muscle memory. And the reason I do that is because our, our muscles just squeeze, they just contract and that's it. Another one straighten them out. So when we start thinking about things in terms of muscles, people think it's purely athletic and it's not that trials doesn't have an athletic component. And there are some theories as to why some people learn faster than others, but that's for another time. The reason I take the cognitive approach, it's because it's all in your brain. Mm -hmm. So all the same principles that underlie studying for a test or studying for anything else apply to trials. Because you have, you have a component where you have a goal, you have, you have the motor sequence that's involved, and you have trying to establish that pathway. And, and, Analogies have their limitations, but what I'd like to think about in terms of learning things, I like to think of it as, as laying roads. So you're making roads. And so these roads are essentially your, your pathways for the techniques. So if you're going to start to, the second you try to do a wheelie in trials, you're basically weed whacking it. And in your brain, it's trying to make these connections between all these complex motor circuits, because it is a complex um, operation so you're basically weed whacking that path and if you keep doing it the path gets wider and eventually you can start to lay down some dirt or you you know the ground put down some gravel dirt grade it soon you might be able to pave it and if you keep doing it you're going to keep expanding that road so you're going to turn from a dirt road to a paved road to maybe a two-lane road and if you if you keep it there you know, that, that road can last for a while, but it may decay. Our goal with the basics and trials is to make that a four-lane highway. That way, you don't have to pay attention to it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we, we could talk about this in a bit, or we could talk about it now. But 
I separate things between online and offline processing or conscious and subconscious, which I mm -hmm. think you've talked about a bit. And so when you, when you make that pathway a highway, then it's less likely to decay. And so it's a cognitive term that we talk about. And I think this is also a good time to talk about learning curves. And um, we always talk about learning curves. People talk about there's a learning curve. And we'll also talk about the forgetting curve. So this is what happens when you neglect your road. It'll decay, it'll fall apart, those kind of things. So when we start talking about this learning curve, and we'll talk about the things that kind of facilitate learning and the things that take away from it, I like to conceptualize it as a learning curve for every part of the technique. So if we start thinking about a wheelie, I'll use a wheelie a lot because well, everyone's really trying a wheelie and it's, it's pretty accessible. So if we think about a wheelie, it's body movement on the bike and it's timing and a little bit of throttle. So you have some gross motor movement, some fine motor movement, in, and that generally results in, in a wheelie. Well, there's a learning curve for that body motion there's a learning curve for where you hit that throttle. Those are all separate skills that actually build into the wheelie. So mm -hmm. your stance on the trials bike and so on and so forth. So we look at the wheelie as something very simple. Like we have a basic wheelie, but really there's two separate learning curves that go into that, maybe even three. So what I like to think about is there's a curve for each component and each of those components add up over time. So you have a separate road for your body positioning on the bike. You have a separate little road for your throttle timing of when you actually use the gas for the, for the wheelie. And so what the strongest way to learn is to strengthen each one of those curves so that it doesn't degrade when you put it into the full sequence. And so the pathway, let's say if we're weed whacking a pathway for our, our basic stance on the bike. And let's just say, let people do static balance in the garage. I'll use that in, as an example. There's right ways and wrong ways to static balance. So if someone's static balancing, are they, are they focused on their stance or are they focused on the stopwatch? And so mm -hmm. my position is that from a cognitive perspective, if you're focused on your stance, then that pathway, that roadway for your stance and how you stand on the machine will be established. So when you go to, take that stance and you apply that to the wheelie, it's less likely to degrade. And, but if you're, if someone's in the garage trying to do static balance and they're hanging onto the handlebars, their heads down, they're just trying to get five extra seconds so they could tell their friends, like I got 86 seconds of static balance or I was there for 31 minutes um, with the Kung Fu grip on the bike. When they go to take that static balance that they have in the garage based off the stopwatch and they go to try to apply that balance and body positioning to the wheelie, their wheelie will struggle. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so spending time on the basics and getting each component of that learning curve that combines into a technique is, is really, really important. And I don't want to go through this too fast, but one of the reasons that it's so important, and, and I talked about this at TTC, is it's what I call the aperture of attention. So if we think about it like a circle or a camera shutter, or you know, like a window that we can fill up, the more, um, the less established the pathway, the more of that aperture that it takes up. So it's our attention span essentially. And our attention span certainly involves conjuring up motor procedures and, and those things, because again, this is all cognitive stuff. So if someone doesn't have an established pathway for something, Instead of that being an automatic process or an unconscious process, which involves different brain regions, that conscious process for the wheelie, if I have to think really hard about my wheelie, it will eat up 30% of that aperture out of 100. And if I'm trying something that's too big for me at first, an obstacle too big, there's another fear component that's going to eat up another maybe 30 to 40%. So now all of a sudden we're at 70% and we're trying to learn a technique a lot less of our resources available than possible. And I think this is why I emphasize the basics so much. If we, if we practice those small parts of the learning curve and build those pathways piece by piece, so the stance on the bike, and then applying that to the wheelie once that's mastered, once we get that to another spot, it actually makes the whole process go faster. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. Sorry, I've been talking and for a long time there. No, you're doing so. Can we talk for a second about those bad habits? What happens if you're, you know, learning a bunch of bad habits, how that kind of highway is being built and then the negative effects it will have later on? Yeah, there's tons of ways to think about that. And I'm, and I'm glad you mentioned it because the wheelie, as you know, is harder than it looks. And that's where a lot of bad habits come from. So yeah. if you can't wheelie, the zap is going to be hit or miss. Um, roll ups will be hit or miss. Um, and that's another thing. So I'm going to go back to how we measure success. Okay. And so when I say that's a relatively permanent change in an organism's behavior due to experience, relatively permanent means it's going to last a while. So if someone can do what we'll call a correct trials wheelie, right? where you're not giving it a ton of gas, you're not trying to impress people to the parking lot, it's, it's basically a controlled wheelie that grants you precision. Mm -hmm. And so if we start off by operationalizing the terms, which I think trials sometimes has a difficult time with, right? Because everyone's got a slight variation on it. But I think, I don't want to speak for anyone else, but the goal is the same. If you're lifting your front wheel, you're either going to try to miss something with precision or hit it with precision. Mm -hmm. And so anything that takes away from precision, we would view as, as dissent. it's just not good. And so when we start talking about the wheelie, we start thinking about feedback loops. And I think um, we could talk about other technique, but I think the wheelie is really handy for people because they, they know it's complex, but they also know it's, it's simple at the same time once they get it yeah. down. And so the feedback loop, is is really really important and there's several different mechanisms but i know you've touched upon this in a video with with negative feedback loops but for the folks that maybe haven't seen all those i'll just briefly describe it so typical trials coaching involves outputs i want you to push on this peg i want you to move your legs here move your hips here and then hit the gas everything's an output well what that doesn't involve is are the other inputs of your system so we have, and so if, if that's a closed system right here, so let's just say you have someone off to the side shouting, hey, you're, you're leaning too close to the handlebars. Now all of a sudden you have some auditory feedback based off what someone sees. Mm -hmm. And you can incorporate that in. That's really helpful. That's why we all like coaching. So we take that feedback loop and now we take that feedback and instead of that loop being closed, we incorporate that feedback into our motor programming. And we do that via proprioception. And that isn't talked about very much. So one of the things I emphasize when I'm, especially when I'm teaching the basics to people is what are you feeling? So if, if you're not, if people aren't thinking about their inputs or what they're feeling or where their hips are at, where their legs are at, at what time did they hit the gas, then, then it's kind of just chance. Then they're not gonna get that relatively permanent state because there's not going to be any consistency and there's not going to be a systematic revision of the components of that technique. So they're going to have weed whack paths all over the place without, without thinking about that feedback. It, it, it'll, it'll be chaos. Um, and then that goes back to how do we measure success? A lot of people, because we are emotional creatures, um, I may measure six. I've so many people have come to me. I've been like, well, I can zap, but just not all the time. And I was like, right. well, what's your ratio? And if they really think about it, they give me an estimate that's, that's a little bit optimistic. And then when we're in person, it drops down, you know, so being accurate about that, but it'll be, it'll be two out of 10. And people right. are so jazzed to get that rear wheel lift, which I completely <laughs> understand. It's addicting, right? It's intermittent reinforcement. You don't know when it's going to come next. And it feels good to get that lift. However, that's not relatively permanent. And that doesn't leave us anything to work on. So they're, they're, that's too inconsistent. So what has to happen is like with any kind of systems, system design, we have to go to the system or two below that because where the system's manifesting the errors are, is usually the result of, of errors in the system below that. So the road network below that is not a four lane freeway yet. So mm -hmm. out of the zap, you know, that involves the wheelie, that involves a jump, that sometimes involves a clutch pop. Those are all separate things that if those aren't established pathways, if those aren't four lane freeways delivering us to that zap, um, then one part while that will fall apart and cascade into the others. Mm -hmm. And then that goes back to the aperture. I know I'm talking a lot, but um, it goes back to the aperture. So if, if it takes a lot of effort to get that car down the road, that's a dirt road. You're navigating potholes. You've eaten up just for that wheelie. 
you've eaten up another 20 some percent. And it, and that stacks up. So every part of that wheelie sequence, every single learning curve that goes into what we can we perceive as a basic wheelie that then goes into a zap, if any one of those components are off, you lose consistency. And so um, it, 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 it's a big thing. So like it, if I go back a little bit, sorry, my, my brain's starting to work this morning a little bit, but when we talk about, you know, the, the relatively permanent part and the change in behavior and someone's like, how do you measure that? You know, so that's the thing. It's like, how do you learn? So you have to have a target. Mm-hmm. And so I think my version of this will kind of adapt over time, but kind of how I'm conceptualizing it right now is you have to have it. You have to have validity and you have to have consistency. So validity is a bit more important, in, but consistency is important too. So for the, for the folks that kind of aren't, Feeling what I'm saying is that, like, if you're if you have a target and a bullseye, and you're trying to hit that bullseye every time, and let's just say you're scattered all over the place, there's no pattern. That's inconsistent, and it isn't valid. You're not hitting the bullseye, and there's no pattern to what you're doing. So let's just say all of a sudden my sights are a little off, and I'm hitting that left quadrant, and all my arrows are cr- clustered around there. Well, that's consistent, but it isn't where I want to be. So our mm-hmm. goal is to get everything in the center of the target and cluster that around. And so we can't do that when little parts of that that wheelie sequence that are contributing to the zap are off. We have to go back and fix those components. Um, so even like to break this down to think about, okay, using an arrow hitting off target, what does that mean for a wheelie? So, and I'm thinking about this in two factors, one of which would be if I'm trying to do a wheelie, let's say onto a log and I'm going to double blip or I'm going to zap or I'm going to do some move and I want the wheel to hit, you know, like two thirds of the way up or something. So mm-hmm. this is where I want my front wheel to hit every time. And it's not. A lot of times it's hitting high for a variety of reasons like fear or anything. So I'm hitting too high. Well, I might be able to start becoming accurate, but if my body posture is wrong, so even if I'm accurate, but I am not in a position on the bike that allows me to then do something. Uh, I've maybe made it consistent, but it's not valid because I'm not in a place where I can, you know, unload or do something else. Would would you say that's right? I would say that's right. And I should have had a notepad here because like the conversations are really where the cognitive stuff applies. So let's just say you're kind of hitting your mark, but it's what you said. Maybe there's a little bit of fear in there. Well, that fear is going to eat up that aperture of attention Hmm. and it's going to take away from your ability to execute motor commands. Because remember, this is all in the brain. You know, our the muscle memory thing, this is why I drift away from it. And I talk about it's all cognitive. So your ability to hit that target every time is a combination of a lot of factors. It's fine motor control. It's gross motor control. It's where you're focused at. Are you thinking about work? Are you afraid of the log? Are you afraid of the obstacle? Um, all those things eat that up. And that's why getting those basics down and establishing those, that's accurate and valid. So at, at TTC, I was standing next to the stage and someone's like, well, how do I know? And I just I picked a very a large patch on the stage. I said, if you can hit this every time, if you can hit this nine out of 10 times, you're getting close. And then I shrunk my fingers down and I was like, that will get you through a lot of stuff. If you can hit this even smaller patch, now you're getting to mastery. If you can, if you can hit that patch and then a few weeks later hit that same patch, now you've got that to where it's been offline. So it's, it's now subconscious processing. So you mm-hmm. look at a lot of the pros and a lot of the expert, they do a wheelie without even thinking. Yeah. And they're going to hit that mark every time because it's an offline process. And when it's an offline or subconscious process, it's less like it's less susceptible to interference. Mm-hmm. So to, to go back to where you're you're like you're you're kind of hitting that target for your wheelie. But there's like a little bit of fear and a little bit of this. I highly advocate for anything that opens that aperture up. So what I want to do is shrink the fear. So. But if we're looking for accuracy, we don't need anything big. Mm-hmm. It could be a very, very small, small log. And I like what you've done with a lot of the walls that you've used. That way people don't have to drop off on the other side. So you, you reduce that. You just have them focus purely on the wheelie, which I would say in the field first before you take it to an obstacle. That sequence has to be wired. And then also I like to have people think about, so when I teach the wheelie, we do it in the field. We do it without the clutch. And the reason we do it without the clutch is that's one less thing eating up the aperture. 
So if the wheelie is tough for us, bringing the clutch into it means that we have to partially balance the motorcycle when we pull the clutch in. So we're going to rely just on the drive of the machine and we're going to focus on the body positioning. And, and one of the ways that I teach the wheelie not to get into like too much into that, but the reason I teach the wheelie the way I do, and I think we've talked about it, I teach the wheelie with relatively straight arms. I'm not mm-hmm. bending the arms. I'm not coming forward. I'm not doing all that stuff because the mo the more units we involve, motor units we involve, and I say that like the command to pull a chest forward, push it back, all those things eat up the aperture. Mm-hmm. And sure, you can you could offline that over time, but it's an incredibly large sequence, and it distributes you all over the bike. So we try to minimize basically the code it takes to execute these commands. So the simplest code is the strongest code. Yeah. And so we teach the wheelie. It's all about reducing load on the system so that you can focus on things. So we don't start out with the clutch and we don't bend our arms crazy. We don't hug the handlebars. Um, we, we use basically a lower body movement to execute the wheelie. And that's something that people can generally latch onto. Instead of saying, I want you to move your knees, hips, upper body, elbow, head, chest and time the throttle and the clutch. I don't do that because that for most people, especially beginners, their aperture is, is, is eaten up by that. And then wheelie yep. becomes, I got one out of 10. I'm pretty happy with that. Cause I did a really cool wheelie today. And that's not how we measure success there. The arrow is totally missing the, the target essentially. Yeah. Yeah. No, I really, really like that because as you said, your brain is overloaded with too many commands and the strongest code is the simplest code. There's a lot of nuggets here that what you're saying are, are great, <laughs> great quotes that could be uh, tweeted on some sort of motorcycle pa- learning page. But uh, those are really good. And and uh, some of the things that I tend to do, at least, you know, as I was learning, was do a lot of stuff in the driveway so that I could I drill in what you're saying about these uh unconscious thing. So I'm going to do wheelie after wheelie. I'm going to, I'm going to, once I can get the, you know, front up, I'm going to try to automate the rear brake so that my right foot is just quick covering the rear brake, bring it back down, bring it back down, bring it. Because once you're up in that kind of, oh crap factor and the front wheel is too high. Now what do I do? And if I have to yeah. think through, oh, first I'm supposed to pull the clutch and then I'm supposed to do this. It just becomes too much. And and when you add, like you said, I love this, that the, the fear can kind of overcome the aperture. When that wheel is high, it's very hard to cognitively process. So uh, trying to create all those automations to take them offline, I think is is such a wonderful uh, uh, way to do it. And and I'm curious to know as a, as a someone who's coaching beginners, what are some of the either drills or ways that you're forcing repetitions and, and encouraging them to be accurate? So maybe let's just stick with the wheelie. How do you get someone to to do these things enough? And when is enough? You know, is it 10,000 repetitions, 1,000? And I know sometimes numbers can vary based on someone's ability to latch on to a simple code. So maybe talk me through a little bit of how you would apply this directly to a wheelie uh, for someone who's wanting to learn that. Certainly, yeah, even in what you just said, there's a lot of nuggets that I can respond to. So again, I focus on the simplest code possible. So we're trying to reduce that load. The second part is feedback loops, right? Mm-hmm. We talked about the outputs and I, I ask people to focus on the inputs. And then I, I, I think about, and, and I know you've had some, uh, some of these talks with Ray Peters and he's, He's really amazing in, in many ways about how he structures his learning because it, it maps onto neuroscience really well. But he's very careful in, and, and I've adopted this, in not providing too much feedback because people are operating close to their, their maximum. So we minimize the code by making the wheelie very, very simple. It's a lower body exercise and it's a time exercise. Mm-hmm. And we try to give, I try to give like visual cues. So what I tell people is, um, for example, imagine a rail that goes from basically the gas cap to the rear fender. So I say your arms, your upper body's not going to do much, but your hips and knees are going to, your hips are going to travel that rail system. And by the time you get to the end of the rail system, your front end is light, you're beyond the point of rotation, which is the rear axle, and a little bit of gas will lift that front wheel. So because instead of telling him do this and do that, the analogy is basically easier to remember than a complicated sequence. So I'm like, the train goes in the station, the train ends the station, and that's when you hit the gas. So re- even right in that analogy, we use analogies because it reduces the load and allows us to conceptualize things. So right then and there, I do it. And what I'll also do is 
have folks, and I'll tie this into the cognitive principle in a second. I have people basically put their, their butt on that fender at the end of the train sequence, or at the end of the rail for their hips. And I go over to the front and I lift their front wheel and they find the bike just wants to flip over. You know, you know that feeling when the bike really just wants to wheelie up and it's pretty effortless. And then I have them move forward a little bit, like halfway through that rail system. And I show them, I kind of hurt my back in training days because, you know, the bike is substantially heavier. So it's a physics game there. So what I do is remind people of that rail system so that when I'm giving them feedback during their actual wheelies, I could say you're not waiting for the train to hit the end of the station. And that resonates because it's an analogy. And I also incorporated that in with proprioception. So not only am I giving them auditory feedback, I'm giving them proprioceptive feedback. When I tell them to sit on the back of the bike and I lift up on the front end, I have them lock that feeling in their muscles. I'm like, can you feel this in your legs? Do you feel where your hips are at? I want you to really think about where those hips are at. And what I'll do is I'll start to raise the bike higher and higher so that they feel the bike start to tip back. And I tell them I'm not going to let them go to reduce that fear, to close mm -hmm. the to, to reduce that part of the aperture. And the bike is off, so I'm just lifting it, and it's just static. But I lift it a little bit higher to see if they do kind of what you talk about. Is that, are their hips going to come forward? Is their chest going to come down? So that's when we start talking about habits. And so what I have them do is I say, fight that habit and keep your hips at the end of the station. And they can do that because they're not moving. So we've reduced that aperture. We've, we've actually opened up the aperture a little bit by reducing the fear, the motor's not running. So we can focus on that one critical part of that learning curve, body position. And I also let them know, until you feel that bike rock, you really don't want to give it a ton of gas. And so, based, so we've reduced the fear. We've got them with an analogy that's easy for us to make modifications to. When I say, hey, you're not, you're at the beginning of the station, you're hitting the gas, that's why you're going so fast. Those kind of things. And then we combine that with the proprioceptive feedback of them feeling the pegs when I'm lifting that bike up. I want them to feel their butt near that fender and so on and so forth. So we combine all those elements. And so that as they get feedback, I can say, hey, did you, did you feel your hips where you were when I was holding the bike? And they can say, no. And if they say, I don't know, I say, hang on, we're going to do that again until you lock that feeling in your hips. And so what I do is I lift that bike again until they can feel that in their hips. And I remind them, like, please don't go try zaps until this is cemented in. Because if you neglect this road, it will never get formed properly. Hmm. The message will get lost. So that's how we involve all those other elements in. Yeah, I really like how you're talking about forcing the athlete to internalize the feeling because then they can provide their own feedback of, oh, I didn't feel my hips back this time. So they could, you know, in a sense, go practice wheelies on their own with no coach and say, okay, the focal point for me is, are my hips back? Are my hips back? And then that feeling can incorporate their own feedback. So you got, you got this thing going to this thing, right? So there's two Certainly. loops. Yeah, and, and, and that goes back to instead of just doing the outputs, we focus on the inputs, and our goal is to minimize error. And so if – and that goes back to how you measure success. You know, so all these things kind of combine together, and a lot of great coaches kind of do this, but I, I really like to focus on the inputs from the individual mm -hmm. because, like you said, that's something they can practice at home. You know, I've had people say, you know, I'm in the right spot here or there, and I'm like, I'm like well, I, I did wheelies for a while, and I'm really tired. I'm like, oh, what's sore? And they're like, uh, and then it dawns on them. You can see it in their face. They're like, uh, my arms kind of where my biceps are. I was like, <laughs> yeah, get on the bars a wee bit, aren't we? And I was like, yeah. where this is a lower body function. So that's feedback. And now they're like, oh, if I start to feel soreness after 10 wheelies and my you know, bicep tendon, that's telling me that I'm doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And so, as Benjamin Franklin said, those things that hurt instruct. You know, so we could we could do it that way, and it's a it's a it's a powerful reinforcement tool. Yeah, yeah, that's good. So you had kind of hit on this concept of if you can make the wheelie a part of your did you call it unconscious? 
um, then you can apply it other way. I heard another coach call it like copy and paste. You know, like once you learn the wheelie, you can just copy it and then paste it into uh, a zap or a double blip or something of that sort. Um, and anyway. I feel like a lot of times we're trying to do all these things at once and then you can't there's no file to draw from to copy and paste it and so then it like you said that the, the maybe you get it one out of ten times if you're trying to zap which has all these different elements and uh, so this is this is fascinating to think through you know why <clears throat> why success is often so low um because those fundamental roads are not well paved and you can't think mm -hmm. through it so this this is wonderful well, and to go to your copy and paste analogy, I don't mind that, but the cognitive side of me says, mm, hold on a second. So the, when we start to offload things, it's less susceptible to interference. Mm -hmm. And so if something is conscious, it can be interfered with. And so it runs on a different circuit. So there's cortical and subcortical structures, you know, things that are kind of in the the wrinkly part of the, that we see on the outside of the brain, and then there are things that are kind of in the deeper structures. And some motor programming can get offloaded that way, where it doesn't really enter parts of our brain that are involved in conscious planning and judgment. So, um, you know, if you look at some of the old robots from MIT when they were programming to do very basic things, their timing would be off. They'd struggle because there's so much, there's so many inputs and everything going on that something as simple as, as catching a door that's closing involves quite a bit. We do it unconsciously because we know exactly how long it will take us to walk those two steps if we speed up. That timing issue is automatic. We're not calculating any kind of advanced calculus there. It's automatic. And so because those involve structures that aren't involved that, that aren't susceptible to um, conscious influence as much they're more foolproof right like we could time that quite a bit and so the same thing it goes with trials the more you offline something the more you focus on one that one curve involved in the wheelie that we mm -hmm. you have your your stance and then you have your wheelie motion the simplified wheelie motion with the analogy and the feedback once that gets established, instead of thinking of it as just copy paste, it's not it's not direct copy paste because copy paste is the same file size, right? We want to shrink that file size so it takes up very little to conjure. So that's mm. basically a zip. If we're going to use a computer analogy, we'll call that a zip file now. Um, it's 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 now a zip file. So that is a zip file that basically operates on its own schedule that we don't have to send. We. We've coordinated with Microsoft Outlook, and that's going to send that code every time we call it up, and it's going to unpackage that zip file, and we're not going to we're not going to touch it with any kind of conscious interference. Mm -hmm. So, and everything that affects our brains will affect how we um, basically do the rest of it. So, if you offline that part of the wheelie, let's just say we're trying to do a zap, and our wheelie is a four lane road, we're good to go. And then now you're trying to focus on your jump and the clutch pop and coming forward to jump through. If any part of those is taking up a lot of the CPU, basically that aperture will struggle. So again, we offline each part of that, which is why it's really important to be patient with learning the basics because it will allow us to basically have three zip files for that zap versus uh, a partial file and a full copy and paste, which means we have to read that entire thing every time we execute it, which will eat up part of the aperture, which leaves less space for proprioception, less space for feedback, and all those kind of things. Yes, I love that, a zip file. So you're saying I shouldn't <laughs> go out and try and learn to zap even though it's really cool within the first week of having a trials bike? <laughs> <laughs> we all know the answer to that, but really what it does is, so we talk about that road analogy and there's limitations to it. Can I think of a better one for now that works. And so, as you're, if you've got that weed back path, and let's just say you get it to a mildly paved country road that wheelie is that you can you can kind of get zaps from, and we're getting three out of ten, or we're mm -hmm. getting we're getting lift, but we're not really looking at the technique. Our goal is to lift the rear wheel. When really, unless you have that target spelled out. If, if you don't really know what the target is for the zap, is it truly just getting rear wheel lift? Is it staying in control? Is it, you know, all these other factors. So you have to operationalize and define that accordingly. But if, if, if you start doing that zap when the wheelie itself is at, 
50%, you're at chance. Or maybe 60%, you get six out of 10 or something like that. And you start adding the zap on it. Your zap won't be six out of 10, but it'll be enough to encourage you to keep doing it improperly. Mm -hmm. And so that's the part that people have to fight. It's very satisfying to get that three out of 10 because it keeps you chasing it. But really establishing a proper goal and keeping it and minimizing all those all those points of interference is is critical to learning. You know, we we don't when when kids learn math, we don't start them out with algebra, right? You tell them that these numbers are concrete, and eventually you're like, we're going to solve for x, and they're like, what's x? And like, well, now that you got the numbers figured out, this x could be a lot of things. It's the same thing. It's it's a cognitive thing. We don't overload the system with things that can't handle yet that eat up the aperture. Mm -hmm. So we be very careful with that. So I want to shift gears for a moment, if we can, and talk about um, the the chemicals in our brain. Um, I know for me, riding trials is fun. Um, and part of that fun is because of a dopamine hit that I get when I am successful in something. Um, and I didn't, honestly, I didn't start out working on turns because that seemed boring. And because when you watch <laughs> X trials, all the professionals are hopping and jumping and, and zapping and splatting. They, they never even show turns on a, indoor arena style trials. So it's just not something you look at and go, oh, I want to aspire to be a really good turner. It's not the cool, sexy side of trials. And unfortunately, a lot of people come into the sport and they see that cool stuff and that's what they want to do. So they might be bypassing the the elementary needed learn to turn and stuff. And now that I've been with uh, trials for about three and a half years and have worked with Ray and others, it's like, OK, I, I need to go back to the found the fundamentals. I need to work on my turns. Mm -hmm. I recognize my limitations are in an event due to the basics. Um, and so I guess my question to you is. Uh, and, and your wife is a good example because she learned all these fundamentals early on. Mm -hmm. And now just this weekend, we started doing splatters together and she goes, oh my <laughs> gosh, this is so much fun. And I was like, isn't this like mainlining the drug? This is like dopamine, just like right into the vein. It's just so addictive because you're winding up that gas. You've got maybe some more fear going on and risk. And so uh, I guess talk to us a little bit about the the chemicals that are released in the learning process and you know for me i know i'm chasing a drug i'm chasing an addiction to the excitement that comes from learning so when i get that aha moment and i make it up the obstacle that to me is is such a sweet taste that sometimes it's hard to stick with these basics of well it's time to pave the road and now let's make it a four lane road and so i'm just up here chasing this instead of this does that make sense yeah, absolutely makes sense. So one thing I'll say before we talk about some chemicals is you can have the fun without degrading your technique. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, there's riding, there's drilling, there's technique practice, there's section practice, there's other kinds of practice, and there's also playwriting. And so I have some friends that they would practice well, make some progress, but they would their their playwriting afterward would actually be two steps up from what they were actually practicing. So they were actually unlearning and that's a mm. thing. So um, before talking about chemicals, no one really knows what learning looks like at the brain. And I know that sounds strange, but we don't have any exact neural mechanisms. There's a lot of receptors. There's a lot of receptor activity associated with it, but that's why I said a relatively permanent change in an organism's behavior due to experience. If I can give you a brain scan and say, you still haven't learned wheelies yet, I don't see enough synapses around uh, the circuit. We have a lot of more interesting things to do in terms of learning. You might just be able to download that somehow or train individual neurons, but it doesn't work like that. So we still have to go from behavior. And so what I say to people who see the really cool stuff, and I think some folks are like that, I A, encourage people to do local trials. When you do local trials in an appropriate class, you actually learn you, you can get a little bit hit of that drug because you'll get challenged, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're an athletic guy, so some of the things that you find challenging actually push you a little bit physically. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, I think for some folks who are coming into trials without much of a background, they can get that same thrill in other ways. Um, and so, but I would say, think about the little pieces that are involved in the techniques. So when people go off to playwright or do that, they look for that hit they're not doing things that degrade that. Maybe if people have their body positioning down and they're good with the throttle, try an exciting hill climb. 
don't try the splatter too early. And so one of the reasons that you mentioned Abigail was so successful at that is we didn't, I was like the splatter police, you know, the zap police. I'm like, hey, let's do something fun with the techniques you have versus go do something that um, is going to degrade or mess up your highway. It's going to reroute you somewhere. It's going to ruin that pathway. It's going to take away from the crews that are building that four-lane road. So if I, and we only have a limited amount of, of road crews, basically. So if she went off to try that splatter, there wouldn't be enough people left to build that wheelie route. So that's one of the reasons we, we did it like that. So in terms of chemicals, it's complex. We talk about dopamine hits, but it's kind of like the, the muscle memory. Um, our happiness and euphoria come from a constellation and cascade of different chemicals. And, and it's really difficult to pin down exactly what that is. So, you know, people talk about serotonin and depression. Well, meta studies over the last 20 years have shown that it's not as simple as we think. Because, for example, if we go back to dopamine, dopamine is one of that and acetylcholine are one of the main neurotransmitters involved in movement and body coordination. But there's dopamine subreceptor type one, type two, type three, type four. So it gets really complex. Some of them are antagonists, some of them are, are agonists. So it, it gets really complicated. So I, I just think about what feels good and we kind of go from there. But that chasing that euphoria is, it's good for a little bit, but if the goal is, if the goal is just to have fun on a bike and not learn, people can do that all day long. But if the goal is to learn, we have to temper that with a little bit of uh, reality and, and say, okay, is this really degrading my technique? And if it's not, then go do it. If it is, take a step back. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, degrading, there's a few things that I'm thinking right now. The first of which is, like you said, when you go try a local trial, all of a sudden you eat some humble pie and you're like, who put this ribbon right here? Like, man, <laughs> exactly. I could have really launched off this thing, but someone made it really <laughs> tight and complex. And now I've got to exercise brake control and a lot of other things. And so uh, the, the reality of trials is pursuing some of this, but within such a confine and such a more controlled environment where it's not just about a uh, you know, race as like a 40 yard runway and then like a 30 yard landing zone. Like <laughs> you can't have all that room. You you have to be able to execute it in such a smaller portion, which requires so much more control and precision. Um, and so I, I think that it's, it's so good to bring it back to, is this helping in a competition? I know for myself, I, I stopped practicing a lot of zaps over the course of the weekend at trials training days because that's not what I need to be successful in the class that I'm planning to ride now. Uh, you know, most of the ride ups are, or most of the obstacles are able to be just ridden up or double blipped. And so I hadn't practiced that for quite some time over the weekend. I was working at turns and cambers and all these things. And then I was like, oh, I want to have a little bit of fun. So I went and trained with Mika Lonsdale in the playground and was trying these uh, other moves. And I was very unsuccessful right away. Like, like I could not zap. I couldn't pop the clutch. My timing was off. It took me like 20 reps to get back to where I felt like I could have been. And, and so I, I'd like to maybe transition to talking about uh, what you had said, uh, the forgetting curve a little bit. And if those skills aren't really dialed in, then I couldn't just draw upon them in the unconscious. I had to pull them out through conscious thought of what was wrong. They weren't yet uh, a highway, so to speak. Yeah, and a lot of the things that in, are involved in us forgetting, it's the same thing if we try to memorize something at work or something else like that. The things that we title as interference in the cognitive literature are, are abundant. So interference could be stress, too much mm -hmm. stress. Interference could be fear. So all those things that eat up the aperture, and over time, as you practice that with those things interfering, you get degraded performance. And so... It, it, and it goes back to making it as simple as possible so that you, when you execute these things, you do it with minimal internal distraction and minimal external distraction. So you make that technique pure so that your curve is strong and that you offline it so that it doesn't get susceptible to as much decay. And so it, the other principle here is overlearning. So you, you, you know, we, we, I think, Ray's used it, I've used it, but you know, there's the saying that says the amateur does it until they get it right and the professional does it until they can't get it wrong. Mm -hmm. And 
I know some of the folks that are starting trials in their 40s, 50s, and 60s, they don't want to spend all the time on the wheelie. So for what they're going to do, they can get a high degree of validity and consistency um, and achieve their targets. You know, it, whether they want to zap or not is a separate thing, but they don't have to get it to where they can't get it wrong, but they definitely want more than a dirt road. You know, a mm-hmm. two lane road will keep them safe. And that's usually what I advocate for. I want people to feel safe and confident and planted. So that it's another feedback part, you know. What did you feel there? Did you feel the bars wiggle? Did you feel it shaky? They're you know, like, yeah, I'm like, okay, let's think about that. Let's trace it backwards and find out why. You know, your leg's not supple enough. Okay. Chase that feeling of being planted afterwards. So we so we strengthen that curve in a short amount of time back to the proprioception, back to the other inputs and feedback loops. And that and that really helps prevent decay because now instead of just having I have a series of outputs. What helps decay is having a more robust, basically a more condensed zip file, if we can stretch that analogy as much as we can. So it's a zip file that's compressed a certain amount, but we're going to take even more information. You could do a lot with the zip file. So the more you could pack in there, the more it can decay and you don't lose your target. So we overlearn it so that we plan for a little, because learning curves are like this, right? They go up, they go down, they go up, they go down. And the curve of forgetting is much the same. You know, it goes down, there's little bumps, but it's quick. So if we overlearn it to here, by the time we go to use it in an event, we're going to be down here because of fear, down here because of ribbon. So if the line for success is here and we only learn it to here, by the time we put that ribbon around us, people will say like, well, I don't know why I could usually do that in practice. Well, right. the reason why is because it wasn't overlearned. So you have to learn it to here. And so depending on how much, so if you're in the appropriate class, you overlearn it to here, fear of the ribbon or fear of being watched takes you to here, you're still above the marker for success. So let's just say we're riding a class too high. So mm-hmm. now we have the ribbon, we have the people. Now we have, we have obstacles that have raised this bar and we haven't changed the peak of our curve yet. So we keep the bar appropriate for our skill level and safety and we overlearn it by adding in the proprioception, the visual feedback, record yourself, look at it, be honest about, you know, where, where your body position's at. So what that does is it, it strengthens that and builds that into a four lane road that's up here so that when you get around the ribbon, you can decay a little bit. Or when you, let's just say life happens and the lawnmower breaks and you can't ride for a week or two, you're going to decay especially mm-hmm. if that process isn't fully offline yet, if it's not subconscious, you're going to decay, but you want your decay to be above the level of proficiency needed. And so that when you pick back up and start to strengthen it again, you haven't lost all that much. So if I'm talking about the wheelie and I decay to here, the lawnmower breaks and I pick up and I try to go to zaps, well, I can kind of do it, but I really need to get that curve back up here before I stack zaps on top of it. So it's it just goes back to how you're measuring success. And, you know, we didn't slap numbers on it, but it, I kind of said three out of ten is not good. Five out of ten is not spectacular. Um, if someone's trying something ten times, some people say twenty. I've been on both sides of that. Um, you can feel when habits are developing, you know, and usually by ten to twenty times, you have some feet. Something is sore that shouldn't be. So that's usually the flag to stop. Because you don't, you don't want to make the road to nowhere. Essentially, the road to nowhere—that's <laughs> good. <laughs> I think I've gone down that road quite a few times. I think we all have. Yeah. I've got to like replant the tree so that the, uh, the so that the neurological pathway can be rerouted. Uh, this is good. This is good. Uh, I want to go in another direction here for just a second and, and ask: How does this impact your practice sessions? Um, so, so getting very practical. Um, you know, maybe with Abigail's development or with your own or new people, what, what do you emphasize? How do you structure? If someone has an hour, let's say, to go out and work on stuff, how much time are you spending on these different things or repeating them or doing them till they can get nine out of 10? Or what can you talk me through what that looks like? Absolutely. That's a great question. So one thing is restructuring people's goals. You know, if someone's like, not to beat the zap to death, but like, I want a zap and the wheelie's not there. Yeah. I'm, I'm very frank about it. Like, look, the, the zap is going to wear you out and you won't learn anything today. And most people are receptive to that. Very few people say, well, I don't care. I, 
And I want rear wheel lift at all costs, you know? So what we do is it's something called, there's a better term for it, but I think the most accessible one is invariance. And so what I mean by that is I want people to be able to access that technique from any angle at any time. And mm-hmm. so when we overlearn something, we don't just learn it in one area. And I think you've touched upon this before um, in other videos. It, I, I relate it to birds. <laughs> people, people laugh at me, but there's, there's something called the traveling salesman problem in the cognitive literature. And they give salesmen this task of mapping out their route in a city to be the most efficient. Right. And, and, and AI will do this. And, and they also give that task to birds. And birds are actually their bird brains than we are and the reason is is we learn the city from one dimension we learn it in basically almost 2d space right we're this tall we're in a car lefts and rights that's all we have birds learn it in 360 and on the z-axis they look at a building from the top and they go down they look at all those things so it gives them more data and so they're they're more capable to carry out these traveling tasks if they have more information and so it's a stretch, but how I relate that to trials and learning is you need to learn things in an invariant way. So our practice structure will be, okay, you have basic turns, you have brake control, you have throttle control, you have body positioning, all those basic skills. Now we're going to start to push them and we don't have to push them with zaps. What mm-hmm. we can do is we can push them with cambers. Yep. So, so now we're going to take that turning skill that they have and we're going to make that invariant we're going to make that resistant to any kind of change we can throw at it by increasing the camber increasing where the arc is on the camber okay if that's too easy we'll make it steeper or since we don't want fear to eat up that aperture we'll put in one little thing at the bottom that's a root that big nothing that's going to make people fall or stumble hard they're not going to be afraid of the root but it's going to let them know if they're weighting the handlebars too much. And Mm -hmm. so those are the steady progressions that strengthen the curve, that build the road and challenge the system. You still get the, you still get the neurochemicals of happiness. You still get that satisfaction, but you're not degrading any of your learning curves and it's not taking away from anything else. So that's what we've done with Abigail is we haven't given her, we've had her learn these things in that invariant manner. We've increased the difficulty without increasing the danger to the yeah. point where she's overlearned it and we can stick her on a camber and her fear is not going to be eaten. The aperture is going to be eaten up by fear for her because she's practiced so much on that camber. So if I throw a log in at the top, she knows, oh, that's just the extension extension of my turn with a little bit of a wheelie and a floater, which is a turn and a wheelie. Those, those two elements are well-practiced. And so if we put her in a spot that's really extreme and we watch that technique fall apart, which is part of how we structure practice, um, we basically find find where the breaking point is in the basics and we take it to the breaking point and then we find the variable that broke it and then we isolate that variable. So if that variable is uh, her floater falls apart at a certain camber, Then we have to figure out why. Was it the fear? And if it's the fear eating up that aperture, then we'll have her go do some floaters in a similar situation on the ground to build up confidence because confidence is a way to beat down that fear, right? So instead of just working on the technique, we work on kind of the emotional side and say, let's take that fear down and give you confidence if we think your skill is adequate to get over that without crashing. So that's kind of how we do it. We just keep building on the basics. It's, it's never, there's never a day that we practice that the basics haven't had an influence. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm trying to, trying to box you in a little bit here. If I'm, if I'm trying to structure a practice for someone who is a clubman uh, level rider, there's obviously Mm going to be a lot of fundamentals. Uh, I guess, give me a, and I know it depends on what they're working on, but give me, you know, how are you going to spend most of your time on technique? Are you going to have some section practice? Where are you going to kind of draw the lines as it relates to how much time to spend on which thing? Well, I think a mixture of all those that you bring up is really important. So if you, if you just do drills and you go into a section and you haven't put all those pieces together, then you're, you haven't practiced exactly what, what the goal is, right? So 
what is the goal? If it's to ride the clubman line at nationals, mm -hmm. then the rules are really interesting. They actually tell us what techniques we need and folks still ignore that to do the cool stuff um, that they view as the cool stuff. So I would look at the rules. <laughs> I would, I Guilty. would look. So, so I had major knee surgery, so I couldn't do some of the cool stuff for a while. So it kind of tempered me back. And so, um, <clears throat> excuse me, but I would look at the rules and say, okay, well, I need these techniques. So I'm going to give myself a test. I'm actually going to say, and be honest, how accurate is my turning with a little bit of a camber and some rocks? Well, if that's shaky, is that because why? Is my body positioning off? So I look at my body positioning. And my body positioning is good. I'm like, okay, well, is my clutch control good? Are all these? So I give a little checklist to see if I can accomplish that technique. So when I look at the rules and say nothing over this high, I think, okay, well, what does it take to get over something that high? We work backwards. It takes a roll up. A roll up is a wheelie, and that's it. Basically, a wheelie into the obstacle and some throttle control. Well, okay, do I have the wheelie? Do I have that body position? Do I have the timing? Is the train going in and out of the station consistently? Am I hitting my marks? And so I work backwards from that. So if I don't have the base techniques, I focus a little more heavily on the technique and drilling the technique, and then I go to put it into a section. And so, yes, you do some section work, but if you don't have the technique, the section work is, is going to actually hurt your curve because you're going to remember basically you're you're not making the prop you, you don't have the roadways established to do that section so you're essentially bushwhacking at a certain point just to just to get through the section yeah if the techniques aren't there it's not going to work um i like that term bushwhacking your way through a section because your <laughs> skills are not developed <laughs> that's not the way to ride trials i've done that i've done that it can be no. a very frustrating day and i and i actually hear that a lot i'll pull up next to somebody at an event i'll be like how's your day going and they're like i'm riding like crap and i'm thinking <laughs> i wonder why you know maybe those skills aren't yeah. honed in yeah no it certainly happens and there's a lot of really good riders by the scorecard that's still bushwhack. You know, people tend to ascend to their highest level of dysfunction, as we often say. And so you'll see something that's ugly, but if the goal is to clean a section, there's a lot of ways to do that. However, event days, cleaning a section, just get it done. Practice days, focus on technique and feedback and loops and, and progression. And that should be the goal, right? The, the goal kind of shifts on, on, you know, I don't just stop in the middle of a section Well, I have, and I learn that lesson. If my technique fell apart, I'm like, well, that's a bummer. My technique is horrible. Oh, I'm still on the clock. I got to get out of here. Um, so, you know, on, on game day, it's a little bit different. But hopefully those, those programs for each one of those techniques is so hardwired from effective basics practice that you can unpack that zip file when you need to. It's going to run automatically. If you're searching for that file location for that zip file, then it's going to fall apart. It's going to turn into bushwhacking. And, and that kind of feeds into another feedback loop, which, you know, the emotional side of cognition, which I and myself and everyone else is susceptible to. So, you know, if one thing happens, it kind of spirals out of control, mm -hmm. right? Because it, it, it's the same thing. You, you get confidence and it builds the same thing. Negativity builds and stopping that sequence is, is difficult. But going back to the basics and thinking about those codes. So like I've seen some folks, I, I have Abigail do it when I mine for her. If she struggled in the previous section, we walk the section and I say, what techniques are you going to use here? And she, and she says this one. I'm going to say, okay, well, go outside over there and practice that technique for a second before you get into the section. And she'll go do it. It refreshes the code. It mm -hmm. reminds her that she can do it. So you build confidence. Now yep. you have a plan you basically queued up that zip file for, yep. for going somewhere. And so now it's more likely to execute on every level. So she's yes. got the proprioception back in there. And so those are just like little things we do to try to bring the confidence back up, to open up that aperture, to not let stress. So a little bit of stress opens the aperture, right? When we're stressed, we could cram for an exam. We could do this. Too much stress shrinks it. Mm -hmm. So getting the appropriate balance of stress, and we do that with a little bit of confidence, a little bit of reminder of that. Hey, you're in the appropriate class for your skills. You have everything it takes to do this. So focus on the execution. Don't think about the result at the moment and it'll, it'll work out. Boy, that's really good. <clears throat> like, I, I don't, I don't even know 
of anything else that there's a lot of nuggets, like I said, but when you just <laughs> said, if the emotional is spiraling downhill and you're losing the confidence, walk the section. I just want to repeat it. Walk the section, find out what techniques you need to use. Go practice those techniques. Make sure you know, oh yeah, I can still do these. You're building the the ability to, to pull back that zip file. That There's just a lot of wisdom in that, Chris, and I, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, that's That's phenomenal. That's phenomenal. Is there anything else that you had on your uh, kind of notes that we haven't covered? Um, I'm looking. It, it was a lot of it was organic, you know, based just based off the questions that people ask and like you're asking. Um, the one thing I guess I'll say that it, it could be viewed as inspirational is that we are all very, very capable of learning. And I think one of the barriers that I see to folks is that they do just focus on those outputs and they don't they don't bring the inputs into it you know, inputs that they would have for anything else in their life, right? And so if you start to bring those in, you shorten the learning curve and you get a lot more satisfaction out of it. And just, and just I, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, just tell me again, out, what is an output? Give me some examples. And what is an input? Give me some examples. An output is what I say, all right. So um, to make your, your right turn, I want you to just push on the right peg, right? That's what we say. We push on the right peg. And what I tell people is, so I'm going to get into the input in a second. I, I think of the pegs like an airplane. I can't go fully out here, but we don't turn the motorcycle by turning the bars. That puts a lot of stress on the arms. The motorcycle is turned by leaning. So I want that airplane to tilt like this. Well, when I give inputs to this inside peg, my outside peg should be giving my outside leg some inputs, right? So I've output for the motor side. My muscles are tensing up. It's pushing down on that peg, but the in, the outside peg should be pushing against my outside leg a little bit. So I tell people like, what do you feel in there, anything? And they say, no. And I'm like, well, do you think, why do you think that is? And they don't know. I said, we'll do another turn. So we combine it with iterations. We don't try to overload the system by asking people too many questions. I say, okay, go back and tell me what you're experiencing from your leg. And they say, well, I wasn't feeling anything. And I was like, okay, are you pushing on the right peg enough? And they'll say, yeah. And I'm like, well, where's that force going? And they're like, well, my arms, I can feel it in my, ah, right there. You feel it in your arms. So right then and there, we've used auditory feedback, my visual feedback. Now they've used a lack of, lack of input from their left leg, and they found that that force was going to their arms. So that is the input circuit that we try to avoid. So I'm like, well, if you feel it in your arms, you're, you're fighting the bike from leaning, which means the bike isn't going to have a smooth pursuit around the corner. And so I say, like, when you see the really good guys, when they do turn and they're not hopping, they just turn, mm -hmm. right? You don't see the bike getting these little perturbations where it stands back up and it gets upright. It's a smooth pursuit around the corner because they're not going from pegs to bars, peg to bar, peg to bars. They're solid input, solid output, solid input, and they balance that out. So when they go the other way, there's no wiggle room in between. And so to, to not to go down a rabbit hole here to think about those inputs and outputs, but another way we test that is, so you say, what does is, what is a practice structure look like? Well, I think that's why the figure eight is so popular in trials. People say, do the figure eight, but they don't tell you what to look for in the figure eight, right? Do the figure eight until you're blue in the face. Do the figure eight until you can make little tiny circles. Um, but we, I like to have people do the clutch out figure eight. And the reason is, as they're pushing, as the airplane's tilting from left to right and they go the other way, I want to see how much their bars wiggle. I want to see how much input they're actually putting back into the bars instead of the pegs. So that's one of the metrics that we use. So we establish metrics for basically all these things that help people give them more feedback and something to look for in their riding. So if you can't ride your bike on the same path all the time without a lot of bar input, then you need to work on your leg input, which means the stance could be off. So we trace it backwards whenever the whatever dysfunction we're seeing manifest is usually the problem and the, the step below it. That's typically how systems work. So what our goal is now for the clutch out figure eight is when they make that transition, they make a smooth transition and that their curve doesn't have any of those standing the bike up kind of moments. And so we, we look at those little fine details and we give some people something that they could basically practice at home. So are you feeling those pegs? Do you feel it in your arms? And what is the behavior of the bike, which is something we didn't tackle, but the bike has its own behavior. And we can look at that, especially through video and our own feedback. So, uh, yeah, it can keep spiraling, we can keep going, because, you know, as you know, riding's complex. But 
those are the kind of things that I tell people to think about. So your outputs and inputs to answer your question about the feedback, those, those are what's involved in the feedback. And, and I think you've done a fantastic job of getting people to do this, record themselves. Yeah. You know, it's humbling, but if you don't record yourself, you're missing out on the most powerful tool that we have, which is vision. Vision dominates 90% of our senses. We don't, we don't go around sniffing people. Um, we, we, we are, we are visual creatures. Um, that's, that's how we do things. And, um, and I think that's, that's crucial. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Chris, I sure appreciate the time. And, and like you said, we, we may have to spiral down some other rabbit holes eventually, but I, I do want to go ahead and cut it here because it's been just over an hour and say thanks yeah. for your wisdom. Thanks for your, your insight into trials. And I, I imagine that a lot of viewers are going to get a ton out of this, especially those that are analytical and want to improve. Some people won't have made it to the end, but for those that, <laughs> uh, that watched enough, I think they're, they're going to really glean a lot from, from what you've had to say. So thanks for sharing that with us today. Well, you're very welcome, and thanks for pinning me down. I know we've talked about this for a little bit, and um, I'm a little bit all over the place, and I'm glad you're asking questions to kind of zero it back in. But, yeah, if there's anything that, anything that people have, they can reach out to me and reach out to you, and hopefully we can help people progress in trials. All right, guys, that was awesome, and I just really appreciate Chris Bazzelli being on the channel. Now, I am curious, what was your favorite part? What was the most profound aspect of this? Go ahead and drop a comment down below, and don't forget to say more in the comment if you want to see more content like this with Chris Bazzelli. Thanks for watching.